going to talk about direct and inverse variation. I'm going to start with a quick note about keywords, then I'm going to talk about some examples that are directly proportional but variation, some that involve inversely proportional variation. I'm going to go over sort of a cheat sheet at the end, and then I am going to briefly talk about how these relationships can be combined. I do want to talk quickly about keywords. Um, you should not use keywords in school, so sometimes teachers teach kids to uh, look for keywords in a story problem. For example, they might tell them, if you see the word all together, then that means this is an addition problem. As in, I have four red markers and seven blue markers. How many markers do I have all together? So I would, and sometimes kids might even be directed to highlight or circle the uh, keyword, and then they would know they should add four and seven to get the answer. Now, this is really bad to do for two reasons, so I don't want you to teach this way. Uh, the first is that it's not always true. Um, I can have a problem like all together, I have 11 markers, four of them are red and the rest are blue, how many are blue? If I were to circle all together and add to solve this problem, add 11 and four, then I would get the wrong answer. Uh, and so it just, it doesn't always work well. But more importantly, even if it did work, you shouldn't do it because it teaches kids to memorize a rule instead of making sense of a situation. Now what we're doing isn't quite the same as keywords. Um, but we are going to do a lot of like, how do I take a statement that says this and turn that into a formula? And um, the reason it's not quite the same to me is that the terms we're going to be using are a little more precisely defined, but I think it's close enough that I did want to comment on it because it's really not something you should do with children in the classroom. All right, so we're going to talk first about situations where there's a direct, directly proportional relationship between two variables. And I'm going to start with a pretty quick or a straightforward example of going to a state fair. We're going to imagine that you're going to the state fair. There's no entrance fee. You can just walk into the fair and look around, but you want to go on rides, you need to buy ride tickets. And each one of these costs the same amount. And we're not going to buy anything else. We're not going to buy any food. We're not going to buy toys, nothing like that. So in that situation, I can make a statement that the amount of money spent is directly proportional to the number of tickets purchased. And so that's where this directly proportional term comes in, and we want to talk about how to represent that mathematically. We're going to have two variables in our formula that we're going to make, which is that the number of x is the number of tickets purchased, and y is the numbers of dollars spent. I do want to make a quick side note about variables uh, and some misconceptions kids sometimes have about them. We might have a statement like 5a plus 7b in math class, and kids will often incorrectly write that that equals 12ab. And a teacher might respond saying, well, you know, you can't add apples and bananas. And a kid might say, or what they're thinking or kind of the logic behind their, this error that we see in kids is you can do that. I have five apples and seven bananas. That's the same as 12 apples and bananas. That's what I have. Um, but that's the problem is that that's not actually what that expression says. So when I have 5a and 7b here, that really means five and there's an implicit multiplication symbol there. And it's not just apples, it's the number of apples. So here the kid is almost reading this like it's a sentence with shorthand, five apples and seven bananas is 12 apples and bananas. But in fact, it should be seen as five times the number of apples plus seven times the number of bananas. So to address this issue, you can do a couple things. One, you might really emphasize that it's the number of apples, not just apples, and try to use that phrasing when you use variables. And more generally emphasize the idea that what goes into these variables is numbers or quantities. It's not um, a real world thing like an apple. And the other thing you can do is don't use A for the number of apples. Use unrelated letters like X. It can get a little harder to keep track of, but especially early on, this can be helpful for kids to really separate the object from the number of objects. And then again, also especially early on, you might include that multiplication symbol. You can still write five times A if you want, instead of just writing the shorthand 5a. All right, so let's go back to our state fair example, where we know that the money spent is directly proportional to the number of tickets purchased. And we have our two variables, x is the number of tickets purchased, and y is the number of dollars spent. So when two things are proportional, we have this situation where the ratio between y and x is always a constant, some constant k. We don't actually know in this case what it is, but we know that it is going to be set, that that k is not going to be changed. And of course, we could also do the inverse. We could have x over y. It would be a different constant. It would be the reciprocal of k. But when we're using these kinds of problems, we might often rewrite them like this. y equals kx. We think of x as the input, some number of tickets we purchased, and y is the output often of how many dollars that would have, we would have spent to do that. 
And then um, graphically, this looks like this, where um, the slope of that line would be changed depending on what K is. And in terms of our context, this story, K would just be the price of a single ticket. Um, but that would also determine the slope of this line. And so what you can see here is that as K as X increases, then Y also increases. And so we might have a point on this graph and that indicates that we spent Y dollars on X amount of tickets. All right, so when we have this kind of situation, we can solve some problems even when we don't have all the information. I still haven't told you what K is. I don't know how much the tickets cost at this fair, but I can still figure th some things out. So for example, on Monday, we can imagine that we spent $7 at the fair. And then on Wednesday, you went back and you bought three times as many tickets. And so we could figure out how much money you would have spent on Wednesday, even without knowing how much the price is per ticket. And this may sort of be intuitively obvious to you watching this video, but I want to talk through the math a little bit because we'll use the same kind of thinking on other problems. So we know that we have this general relationship. In particular, the amount spent on Monday is K times the number of tickets spent, bought on Monday. And we know that that was seven. So let's look at Wednesday where we have the same general relationship. But we can stop, we know something about the number of tickets purchased on Wednesday. Specifically, we know that it's three times as many tickets as it was on Monday. So I can fill that in here instead of having XW. Um, and then I'm gonna just switch these two numbers using the commutative property. So I know that the number of tickets bought on, or the amount spent on Wednesday costs three times K, whatever our cost is times the number of tickets bought on Monday. Finally, I want to focus in on this last part of the problem, this XK, um, X times the number of tickets on Monday. That should look familiar. We saw that up here. Um, and so we already know something about that. So we can substitute that in. We know that the amount spent on Wednesday is three times the amount spent on Monday. So we have our sale, our uh, trip Monday here where we bought some tickets and spent $7. And when we go on Wednesday, we spend three times, or we buy three times as many tickets, which causes us to spend three times as much money. Um, we can also see these as proportional, or I mean, similar triangles, starting with at the origin. Now, it's important to note that this only works because this is a pro proportional relationship that goes through the origin. If there were an entrance fee, then uh, this same rule wouldn't work because it's not just the number of tickets that we have to look at, it's that entrance fee, which would be a flat rate that would be shown um, by having the graph move up and having a y-intercept that wasn't zero. So this only applies to ones that are directly proportional through the origin. All right, I wanna do another example. We're gonna imagine I have a giant room and it has no air in it, it's a vacuum. We've pulled all the air out of this room. We have a robot in there because we can't breathe so we don't wanna go in. So we have a robot in there, it's gonna drop a block. And we have all these floors and then we have different windows that you can look at and you decide to stand here and look through the window, the third level window. And we've numbered them 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 as it goes away from the robot. So the robot drops the block and as it's passing you, you're wondering, hmm, how long did the how long ago did the robot drop it? Like how long did it take to fall that far? And you ask your physics friend your physics friend sort of looks at the setup, thinks about it, and in a very helpful manner answers, well, I don't know all the details, but the amount of time the block has been falling is directly proportional to the square root of the floor number. Okay, so maybe not super helpful, but it's still some information we can use to uh, solve some problems and write some equations. So our variables are gonna be Y is the number of seconds that it was dropping, and X is the number of floors down that it fell to. So we have a relationship like this where y is directly proportional to the square root of the floor number. So it's not just x anymore, but it's the square root of the floor number. I'm gonna push all that up so I have a little more room to do some math. Now, maybe we went back and we timed it. We saw it takes eight seconds to fall to floor three. And then you ask yourself, well, how long would it take to fall to floor six to fall twice as far? If it were just directly proportional, we would know that if we doubled x, we would double y, but we didn't, we have this square root here which is kind of throwing things off. But we can think through what happened. 18 equals k times the square root of three. Now we could solve for k, but I also wanna talk through the logic of how we can think about this without solving for k. So we don't know 
how far it will take to get to the sixth floor, but I do know that I can think of six as two times three. It fell twice as far. So I can um, break up my square root to look like this. And I'm going to use the commutative property again and flip those first two values. And then this should look familiar, k equals square root of three. We have that up here, 18 equals k times the square root of three. And so I know that my new value will be not double 18, but the square root of two times 18. And so that tells me something about how a, this kind of relationship works. All right, now I wanna talk about inversely proportional situations. They're pretty similar, um, but they are a little different. Your kid has a pint of water and they are pouring it back and forth between two cylinders. And your kid is very careful. So they fill up this one and then they pour it over to this next one and they don't spill any water. It's always the same amount of water. And they, they explain, look how high the guy was in this one. And as one is, is likely to do, you start thinking to yourself, hmm, you know, I wonder if I could express the relationship between the height of the water and the size of the cylinder. And you do some more experiments, maybe draw some pictures, do a little math, you think about it a little and you say, the height of the water is inversely proportional to the square of the diameter of the cylinder. So that's how I talk usually. So I'm sure that's what you'd say to yourself. So let's think about what this would look like. You get excited and you think, awesome, now I can write a formula. Uh, and you say your variables are gonna be H for the height of the water in centimeters. And here I am switching to using a variable that kind of matches the name. Uh, one, since we're adults watching this video, I think it's okay, we'll be able to keep track, but also height is actually a, a unit or a measurement that is numerical. So for me, it's a little bit different than the other kinds of variables. And then D is the diameter of the cylinder in centimeters. And you know, because you said it that way, that the height is inversely proportional. So it's not H equals K times D squared. Instead, it's one over D squared. And it's squared because so the inverse part is the fact that it's the reciprocal or the inverse of d squared. And the square comes from the fact that it's related to the square of the diameter, not just the diameter. And just to make things a little cleaner, I'll just put the k on top there. I'll multiply it through and have h equals k over d squared. All right, so then you think, obvious next step, I bet I can write some math problems for myself and solve them using this information. Uh, so you imagine a scenario where the water was 20 centimeters tall in cylinder A, filled this up 20 centimeters, and then cylinder B is three times as wide. So however wide this is, this is one, two, three. And you ask yourself, well, then how high would the water be if I pour it from cylinder A into cylinder B? So again, same amount of water. We're never changing the amount of water. So you like, let's bust out the formula. HA equals 20 equals K over the diameter squared. And we also know that the height in cylinder B is going to be K over the diameter of that cylinder squared. And we know something about the diameter of B, which is that it's three times as wide as cylinder A. So we're going to go ahead and triple it and put that in there. And now we're going to look at this bottom part and clean it up a little and get three squared um, and diameter of A squared. And then we're going to clean it up a little more and turn that into one ninth times K over diameter A squared. And this should look familiar. And we have it up here. That is the, the height of the water in cylinder A. And we know what that was, that was 20. So we know that the height in B is gonna be 1 9th times 20 centimeters, or just in general, it'd be 1 9th of the height of cylinder A. And so that tells us a little bit about those relationships between those numbers. All right, I do wanna share a couple sheet sheets because um, I wanted you to understand the logic behind these, but in terms of say taking a licensure test, you might just need to know them kind of quickly. So the base case, this is for directly proportional situations. The base case is where Y is directly proportional to X. So then we have Y equals KX. That was the first case we looked at with the state fair. And then I'm asking you to think about, okay, if I'm doubling X, then what am I gonna do to Y? I'm gonna also double Y, I'm gonna multiply Y by two. If I were directly proportional to the square root of x, then I would just multiply by the square root of 2. I wouldn't double it. And if I were directly proportional to, say, the cube of x, then I would multiply, and I doubled x, I would multiply y times 2 cubed, or 8. Inversely proportional works pretty much the same way, just everything's the reciprocal or the inverse. So it, the main case is this, where it's directly inversely proportional. Sorry, 
so not the right way to say that. If it's inversely proportional to x, y equals k over x. So if I were to double x, I would have to halve or multiply y by 1 half. Um, right, and if it's square root, I get this, and if it's say cubed, I get one over two. I multiply y by one over two cubed and get one eighth. Again, these are all for examples for doubling. If you were tripling or quadrupling or whatever, you'd need to adjust this two is would be what would change. All right, and then I wanted to briefly note that you can combine these relationships. You can have more complex statements. I'm going to do a really straightforward example with the area of a rectangle. We know that the area of a rectangle is directly proportional to its length and to its width. So I've got A is the area in square centimeters, L is the length in centimeters, and W is the width in centimeters. So A is directly proportional to L and to W. If I were to um, increase L, then A would increase, and if I were to increase W, A would increase. In our situation, because I chose centimeters and square centimeters, actually k is 1, so I'll just take that out to simplify it. And so we can see here, like, if I were to double the length of a rectangle, I would double its area. If I doubled the length and tripled the width, I would increase the area by a 6, by multiplying by 6, by a factor of 6. Um, and so we can combine more and more complicated statements. So there's a Desmos activity to go along with this, and you'll be able to play with some more complex relationships and think about the numbers involved in them. Please send me your math questions about this video or anything else at matthewmattfk at gmail.com or leave a comment on this video. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Math's not a problem with Matthew Matt.